Maria Jose de Matre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I want to start by thanking, uh, what happened? I'd like to start by thanking you by, for inviting me. I think this is a very exciting opportunity. Uh, and I would like to speak about recognition of studies in Latin America as part of, as a tool for flexibility, which is now uh, a very important aspect of uh, higher education and a way to respond to the needs of a wide range of students. I will deal with, but I will start with sharing with you some relevant features of higher education, the issues that were identified in one of the tracks in the UNESCO Regional Conference for Higher Education, which was held in 2018, and then the perspectives for recognition in Latin America, which is really uh, a work in progress, as I said. So in, in order to start with the relevant features of higher education in, Ameri in Latin America, I would show you there is an increased demand and enrollment in higher education. It has grown very quickly. Now it's beginning to reach a plateau, mainly for demographic reasons, but also because in most countries, uh, coverage has grown significantly. Um, this graph shows how important it is the higher education and, and how in many cases it has brought into this sector mostly people from lower income and disadvantaged groups through different national policies for student aid and for other uh, such as alternative admission requirements, uh, coverage of uh, complementary um, issues to, to address the failures or the failings of secondary education and so on. So this is an important aspect of our higher education systems. Then we have, in order to respond to that, a diversification of provision. We have over 11,000 higher education institutions in the region, 4,000 of which are universities. And there's a wide dispersion. Some have more than 200,000 students, others have less than 1,000. And I'm here, I'm speaking mostly about universities. There are state-owned universities, there are private universities with public funding, and there are public private institutions with no public funding that depend exclusively on student fees. There are elite universities, there are mass higher education institutions, there are indigenous universities, multicultural universities. Some of them publish over 300 papers a year. About 1,500 of the universities haven't published one single paper in the last five years. But at the same time that there's this big diversity, there is also a strong force towards convergence. Convergence in the sense of trying to uh, emulate, to copy the more traditional and prestigious higher education institutions, mostly because of a strong weight of academic and traditional norms and values, which are also reflected in legislation, in quality assurance, uh, criteria, etc. And there's also a very because of this, there's also a very diverse student population. You see each of these little circles represents a different group. We tend to focus on the center one, graduates from secondary education who want access to regular higher education. Uh, the graduates from secondary who want access to regular higher education. But we have adults who didn't attend higher education and want to improve their qualifications, their professionals who want to upgrade their training, their youth and adults that can only work, that can study part-time, men and women who need to raise a family and take care of them, youth and adults who wish to certify specific competencies, graduates from 
vocational education, youth and adults who want a regular professional or academic education, people who have incomplete higher education studies and immigrants who want to gain qualifications. So the, the question is how are we going to attend all these different needs and demands only with one tool? Someone said, if you only have a hammer, you will treat everyone as a nail. Well, we tend to treat all these students as if they were graduates of secondary education, full-time students. And that is one of the things that we need to correct. We tend to think of education as a linear thing, linear process. You go into primary education, then you go to secondary, higher education, graduate studies. And from there, you either go on to the work market or you go to academia. But in practice, learning is an ongoing and it's a lifelong process. We ask, what do I want? I learn to do that, then I do it. But then again, I want something else and I learned that Then I do. And, and it's a spiral that we need to take into account. So this, these are the challenges that face higher education in Latin America and probably in most countries. Um, Another thing is a strong influence of quality assurance mechanisms. This has been a success story. Quality assurance started in Latin America in the 1990s. And it did a number of good things. It helped develop a culture of evaluation. Uh, societies highly value accreditation. And there was an effort to develop standards that made it easier to understand what was meant by quality in higher education. What had happened 25, 30 years later? The, the culture of evaluation has moved into more of the same a bureaucratic formal approach. It is the same self-assessment report that you write every five years just updating a few data. In many cases, not all of them, but it is a risk. The high social value for accreditation has turned as accreditation seen as an end, another means. So we have developed, instead of a culture of quality, a culture of compliance. And you can hear some rectors say, accreditation is paralyzing or uh, accreditation. I do this because if I don't, then I won't be accredited. And the development of standards to define quality, which was a very good thing at the beginning of the 90s, now it does not take into account diversity and criterion standards are relatively homogeneous and apply equally to different types of higher education institutions. So here we have a risk this success story is turning into a risk for innovation, for different aspects of which recognition is one of them. What did the higher, uh, the, the regional conference for higher education, which was uh, designed for, um, for the, in, in preparation for the for the um, World Conference in Higher Education of UNESCO. So, um, what what was said there? The first one was articulation, articulation between school and higher education to make the transition easier and with increased options. In Latin America, students have to decide on a professional or academic track. Uh, profession course a program immediately after leaving secondary education so students finish uh, school at 15 16 18 years old and have to decide whether they want to become a teacher a lawyer uh, a journalist articulation between within higher education and 
the, the regional conference spoke of the removal of barriers to mobility between levels, programs, and higher education institutions. In quality assurance, the, uh, the, the recommendation was to introduce standards that recognize articulated and flexible learning pathways. For higher education institutions to revise curricula, to make them for, more flexible, to recognize prior learning, to establish new qualifications such as micro-credentials, badges, or modular teaching and learning. At the level of policies, to recognize the right of students to their studies and qualifications so that they could be recognized and more flexible structure of degrees and qualifications, the development of the integrated qualifications frameworks, and also articulation between higher education and the productive sector. A second priority was the teaching and learning function in higher education. Remember, this was before the pandemic, but the pandemic has shown us how central to higher education teaching and learning is. But in 2018, this was already recognized and valued. And that meant to train teaching staff to be able to address the new roles linked to changes in higher education. One thing is to teach top students in each country. Now we have to teach all kinds of students with all kinds of different interests, which changes the role of the teaching staff. A focus on lifelong learning, including a revision of undergraduate curricula. For instance, uh, years ago, undergraduate curricula was meant to cover all the main issues in a given discipline. Now, most students go for, to further study uh, graduate work, masters, PhDs, uh, and other world ways of further education. So the undergraduate curricula should be rearranged or revisited in order to develop and in taking into account the development of further learning opportunities. And another thing that was highly recommended was the need to recognize and value what was called the virtuous diversity, because it is the way to respond to new needs and demands to prepare people for lives and work that are very different. And another issue was the assurance of lifelong professional competency. In Latin America, universities grant a degree and that degree is the equivalent to professional certification. So it was recommended to develop professional certification mechanisms, which would consider formal training, but also experiential learning, uh, the academic component certified by the university, the professional or labor component certified by external uh, bodies. To have recertification to ensure updating of professional competencies. Another thing that happens is in our region, a professional degree is forever. So I was trained as a sociologist and I can still speak of me as a sociologist, although even though I haven't read a sociological book for years, but I am still entitled to call myself a sociologist. And then the promotion of lifelong learning in three levels, further education, recycling or specialization of individuals who had a degree, updating, either autonomous or supported by higher education, and the recognition of incomplete studies. We have high rates of attrition. And if we don't recognize those incomplete studies, students would have to start all over again. So what are the perspectives for recognition in Latin America based on, that, those, uh, on those issues? The first is that recognition has been a theme for international agreements. In 1974, there was a regional convention for the recognition of degrees, and it was ratified by 11 countries out of 33, about two of which eventually did something. 
Then there's a lot of bilateral or multilateral or automatic recognition agreements. They were signed at the beginning of the 20th century when higher education was very different. And so now they're being revised. And uh, probably most of them are not be operative, but they still exist. Then there's a new type of bilateral or multilateral recognition agreements, which are linked to quality assurance decisions. We have them between Chile and Argentina, Argentina and Colombia, and so, so on and so forth. I'm having trouble with this. No. Then there is the ARCUSUR program. This is um, an agreement signed by the ministers of education of the partners in Mercosur, which is the common market of the South to recognize the academic and scientific quality of programs which are accredited under ARCUSUR rules. This is the only program in the MERCOSUR agreement that really works, but it is only for academic and scientific quality. And then there's a new convention based on the UNESCO Global Convention for the Recognition of Studies. It was signed by 23 countries in 2019. It requires at least four countries to become in effect, but to date has been ratified only by Peru, Granada, and Cuba. So all the more relevant countries have not really ratified it. Why is that? One of my hypotheses is that it's ge geopolitical. Latin America is a region marked by conflict and segmentation. Most of our of our countries have defined their identity uh, against their neighbors. What unites us is language, even though we don't always understand each other, and religion, but which has special features in different countries as it is in decline. But we don't trust each other. We have had wars between, we have never had a global war, but we have had wars and conflicts between almost each pair of countries. Heads of state in every summit agree to establish a Latin American higher education space. And this has been going on for about 15 years, but it does not go beyond the discourse. And part of the reason for that is that in many countries, it is difficult to agree on a national higher education space. There are a few, if any, occasions where different types of higher education institutions meet and collaborate. Publics don't talk to the private, universities don't trust the non-university institutions, the research universities don't trust the teaching universities. All this is changing, but very, very slowly. Then there's policy and regulations. There is a strong financial support for lower income students. Uh, but little or no priority to recognition of incomplete studies or of prior degrees at the university level. Some at the Tibet level, but not really too much. But even the strong financial support for lower income students is uh, linked to complete programs, to regular programs, and not for re-entering higher education. There has been a significant improvement of information systems, but as reported by one of the leaders of the, of the information system in Chile, they do not address recognition opportunities of flexible learning pathways, not because they don't want to, but they don't know how to. And then students don't have information about what they could get in different institutions. There's also strong resistance to recognition mechanisms, mostly because of low barriers to professional performance. This idea that universities grant a degree and that degree entitles you to operate your profession uh, makes it uh, very uh, difficult for countries to recognize uh, degrees because of that. And quality assurance mechanisms, which are recognized in value, they do not encourage recognition of studies or degrees, and in many cases look at innovation with mistrust. So the issues that make flexibility difficult, 
It's legislation because legislation is based on very traditional values. National policy is based on traditional principles. We tend to value traditional uh, higher education and our most prestigious universities, of course, are those traditional ones. And this is where convergence becomes an issue. The quality assurance requirements and criteria, which are still focused, which still focus mostly on uh, what has been done on regular programs and courses, funding policies, the fragmentation and segmentation of higher education systems of which I already spoke, the organizational and academic structure of higher education, which is still designed and organized in terms of full programs, four, five, six year programs, students entering on one end of the tunnel and getting out at the other end. And there's no links between tunnels. Institutional culture and conservatism and lack of adequate information and guidelines. So these are the, these issues which is, sorry for this, the main issue is lack of trust among countries, among higher education institutions, between quality assurance and institutions, and among quality assurance agencies. So this lack of trust is probably the main issue we need to address. However, institutions consider flexibility and recognition important, and they make their own arrangements, mainly through bilateral agreements. So they have developed alternative admission processes and special admission agreements between higher education institutions. They have established transfer opportunities between programs or institutions. They have mechanisms to recognize prior learning at the program level, what they call exams for relevant knowledge. And they develop flexible modes for teaching and learning to address the needs of diverse groups of students. But these apply only to the institutions entering into those agreements. They are not something that goes through, uh, they do not affect the entire higher education system. In summary, recognition and flexibility are necessary and most individual stakeholders understand and admit it. It is easier at the TBED section than at universities. Recognition will develop, but mostly at the result of a bottom-up demand. Networking can help. We can learn from each other. But even in a network like SINDA, which groups most of the more prestigious universities in each country, recognition is still a work in progress. It is still resisted by most universities. So to conclude, and this is really the last slide, recognition requires change in many aspects of higher education. But change is never easy and never quick. It doesn't work immediately. There's always a period of temporary incompetence. It takes time and demands patience, conviction, participation, learning and unlearning, which is very hard, tolerance to ambiguity and to mistakes, and the capacity to start over. The more relevant the changes, the higher are the requirements. The more relevant the changes, the higher are the rewards. Of course, change is costly. Not to change is much more costly. As I said before, we're working on it, but is still a work in progress. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Jose Lametre, for this uh, very insightful, very interesting uh, presentation and keynotes on quality development, particularly from a Latin American view. We have approximately five minutes left, uh, and I do want to use the remainder of the time to ask you a question which came in from our chat. Namely, you talked a lot about trust, about lack of trust in particular. There's one question here that I think is very pertinent. So what do you think can be done to foster trust between institution and states, the lack of trust that you have bemoaned uh, throughout uh, your keynote? I think that trust is something that will be developed, but probably not on a overall uh, way. 
So what we need to do is to build trust between groups of institutions. That's why I think networking is essential as a tool for development. When institutions meet their authorities, where academics can work together in projects, when vice rectors meet every now and then and discuss and develop uh, initiatives that they're all interested in, they start uh, recognizing that the other institutions are also worthwhile that they can develop in a common way. One of the issues here, I think, is to really work on the quality assurance systems. Quality assurance mechanisms should be a very important element in developing trust. Unfortunately, it has not been so, but we're working at it also in RIASES, the network for Ibero-American quality assurance agencies, and we're developing a, a system to recognize and certify the quality of quality assurance agencies. Maybe once we proceed further on that, we will be able to recognize accreditation decisions and then that will also help improve uh, the trust between uh, different countries, different quality assurance agencies and different institutions. Thank you so much, Maria Jose Lametre, for this response and, of course, for the keynote, for your participation, for your input. Thank you so much for joining us here at the International Conference on Recognition.